Tonight, as we see, we'll talk about the Trump administration, first 100 days, triumph or turmoil, and, and help us really understand the complexity of this administration, where it's going, and, and what he sees. So, Mark, thank you very much for making time for us. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you for coming out on this evening where you have many choices how you can spend your time. So I appreciate that you're here uh, to listen to my presentation about the first 100 days of the Trump administration. Um, now, where did this 100 days metric come from? Historically, it has been tied to the um, accomplishments of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the uh, historic first 100 days of his administration. And Mr. Trump himself recently has said that this is really not a fair metric by which to evaluate a presidency. It's kind of an arbitrary um, uh, standpoint from which to take the temperature of administration and assess how well it's doing. And I do think he has a point there. Um, we could be saying the first 150 or 200, so what's, what's the meaning of 100? Well, it is a standard metric by which many evaluate how things are going in the early stages of an administration. Certainly no president can live up to the standard that Franklin Roosevelt had established in his first 100 days. So in that sense, I agree with uh, the current president that this may be an unfair standard. But nonetheless, Donald Trump did establish this standard as one by which he should be measured when he was a candidate for the presidency last year. Uh, so if you go back to the 2016 campaign, uh, Donald Trump, uh, it, it, toward the end of October, uh, within just a couple weeks of Election Day, gave a speech in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where he outlined his 100 days plan to make America great again, his contract with the American voter. And so here, uh, candidate Trump was presenting his commitment as to what he would accomplish in the early days of his administration, making his promises to the American people about where his priorities would be and what exactly would be different about America after 100 days of his presidency. So, in a sense, we are taking Donald Trump at his own word here uh, in evaluating him because he did establish the 100-day standard as something by which he himself should be measured. Now, if you can just wrap your mind around this idea of Donald Trump's Gettysburg Address. So it's, it's a great title. Right, there you go. If you know in American history, of course, there's a fam very famous speech, but um, it's, not, it's not Donald Trump. Anyway, uh, what I want to do is look at the, the, the policy promises, the actions that Trump said that he would um, uh, focus on in his first 100 days, and then examine how things are going so far. So, among the promises, the president said he would take a series of executive actions. Uh, 18 of them were outlined in his um, first 100 days action plan. And these included withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, renegotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, uh, removing roadblocks to the Keystone XL pipeline, and also instituting what he called extreme vetting of immigrants coming into the United States from uh, what he declared to be terror-prone countries. And so, just as background, of course, when we talk about executive actions in the U.S. context, we're talking primarily about uh, vehicles of unilateral presidential um, decision-making, such as executive orders and presidential memoranda, which are very similar but uh, slightly different from each other. But essentially, uh, these are powers that presidents have that enable them to uh, affect certain changes or, let's say, uh, make certain declarations about the implementation of public policies that already have uh, uh, authorization. Uh, so executive actions in the form of executive orders or presidential proclamations are not the equivalent of uh, governing by legislation. In other words, the president is acting under pre-existing authority, and uh, in many cases, the president is simply authorizing the executive branch departments and agencies to fulfill the requirements in a legislative enactment by 
uh, instructing the departments and agencies to do the following things. Now, where that potentially gives a president substantial power is where there is some ambiguity in the law as it is written, uh, which enables a president to exercise some discretion about uh, how he interprets the meaning of the law in directing um, executive branch departments and agencies and how to implement uh, the law. But again, one of the themes I'm going to make here, uh, since uh, to foreshadow a little bit, there really is no major legislative accomplishment by the Trump administration in the first 100 days, but the president has been claiming that he's had a very successful, extremely active first 100 days, and he is returning repeatedly to a number of the executive actions that he has taken as proof that a lot of things are happening. Um, executive orders and presidential proclamation oftentimes are not long-lasting because what one president does, the next one can undo, uh, similarly by uh, an executive order or presidential pro proclamation. Okay, uh, the president's action plan uh, also included in the first 100 days, um, 10 legislative measures that he said he would work with Congress to introduce within the first 100 days of his administration, and foremost among these would be repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare. Uh, provide middle class tax relief, tax simplification, reducing the number of tax brackets in the United States from seven to three, he said. Ending illegal immigration, beginning to build a wall along the border <coughs> with Mexico and spur infrastructure development and save American jobs. So uh, that's a pretty ambitious um, start to any administration, and that's what the president was saying. And if you uh, go back and listen to some of the rhetoric uh, in the campaign, so often he would say the words, it's going to be so easy. It's going to be so easy. The problem is we just don't have smart people in government right now. And if we just have people who know what they're doing, all of this can get done. So here is the very successful businessman, right, who knows that he understands how to run a large, complex organization and get things done. And so the problem, he thinks, is that we haven't had people with his skill sets running our government. We've had these career politicians, these Washington insiders, these people who all think within sort of the same framework about how to deal with public policy issues and problems. And part of this populist appeal was projecting um, this argument that somebody with a different skill set who knows how to get things done can make government work. What he has found out, of course, is that trying to run a government is nothing like trying to run uh, a business in the private sector. And even he himself, as I think you have seen in the news accounts, has admitted this is a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Uh, so there was a really revealing um, media interview that he did several days ago uh, in which the president said that he misses his former life, he was happier doing what he was doing before, and that he didn't know when he got into this just how difficult it is to be president. So think about that for a minute, right? Didn't have an idea how difficult it is to be the president. Um, imagine that, it's a hard job. So uh, anyway, uh, so, so again, you know, the 100, day, 100 days action plan is putting forth a lot of very ambitious ideas and reforms, and Trump is telling his followers, these things are going to happen, it's not hard to do. The problem is we need to get those other politicians out of the way and let me and my people come in there and start fixing things. Uh, he also promised that he would quickly nominate a judge to replace um, the vacancy of the Supreme Court from Antonin Scalia's passing, and that he would implement a whole series of ethics reforms. So, now that we've reached, well, exceeded now, I think it's day 105 or so, uh, the 100-day stage, um, let's take a look what actions he's taken, what he's done to implement this contract with the American voter, how have Congress, the courts, and the American public responded. Um, to Mr. Trump's initiatives. Now, keep in mind, um, although Donald Trump won the presidency as a Republican, he is not your typical Republican. Uh, he had a great deal of, of populist appeal 
uh, due to uh, his anti-Washington uh, themes in his campaign. And much of his campaign really focused on uh, three very big themes, economic nationalism, okay, putting America first, immigration restrictions, and trade protectionism, also a part of his put America first agenda. Much of these ideas run completely contrary to mainstream Republican Party thinking in the United States. Most Republicans are free traders. Okay? Um, they don't buy into this economic nationalism, you know, protect American businesses first and, and the like. Um, they're certainly not in favor of trade protectionism. Uh, but Trump's populist message appealed also to uh, traditional older white working class, usually Democratic Party voters. So you saw on election night, right, when so many people were so surprised uh, by the outcome of that election in the Electoral College that Mr. Trump uh, was prevailing in large part because of the appeal that he had um, with a significant number of traditional Democratic Party voters in, um, in working class communities, particularly in the manufacturing sector communities that have been devastated over the years by um, you know, the trends of globalization uh, in, in, in the economy. And he, you know, he very purposefully um, appealed to those voters as a way to break into um, the traditional base of Democratic Party support, which is what he had to do uh, in order to win the presidency. So, when I was here in October, not in this city, but I was in Germany giving some lectures, and I was talking about um, the Electoral College at one point, and what the Electoral College map looks like. And I put up the Electoral College map that many people had already seen, uh, that showed that things looked really good for Hillary Clinton. Um, now, I put up some slides that said, here's the path to Donald Trump's victory, and this is a realistic path, and these are the reasons why. So when you look at the original map, it, I took all the states that in the previous six election cycles had gone either Democratic five or six times or Republican five or six times. If you take the blue states, the Democratic states, either five or all six elections went Democrat, um, Hillary Clinton was one state short of winning the presidency, Virginia, so where I teach. And she won that state by several um, percentage points in this election. So if she had merely held the states that her predecessor, Democratic nominees, had repeatedly won and then picked up Virginia like she did, she's got the magic number. She needs an electoral college to become president. The red map for Donald Trump looked really depressing. Um, he was far short of the number of electors needed in the electoral college to win the presidency if you took those five out of six or six out of six Republican states. Uh, so what that meant is there were two paths to winning the presidency. One is to run the board, okay, win every single competitive state that's remaining in the Electoral College, no room for error at all. Or secondly, as we put it, break the blue wall. Find some bases of Democratic Party support that will take some of those Democratic voters and shift them into the Republican column. And that was the political brilliance of this whole strategy of economic nationalism and trade protectionism. You had large numbers of manufacturing sector employees in Midwest, upper Midwest states whose livelihoods have been devastated and who have felt that their party, traditionally the Democratic Party, was not talking to them, but Donald Trump was. And you saw the criticism of Hillary Clinton after the campaign. You never went to Wisconsin. You barely visited those upper Midwest states. You did not talk to those people. You took them for granted. All of it true. Um, so this has caused, though, a difficulty for Mr. Trump in the governing context. Because, as you know, we're nothing like a parliamentary system. We do not have stronger dis disciplined political parties that stay together and work together in both the legislative and executive branches. Um, members of Congress are individual <coughs> entrepreneurs who have their own appeal within their constituencies, raise their own money, and they are not dependent on the political party, and they are not dependent on the president 
is if he is of their own political party for their positions. And they could oppose their own president from their political party um, if it helps them with their own constituents. And they will do so, and they do uh, repeatedly. So you have a Republican president now who's put forth a number of core issue positions, commitments that he made uh, to his supporters that are out of sync with much of the thinking of many Republicans in the Congress. So he can't hold his um, Republican coalition together in both houses of Congress very easily. Um, but also the anti-Trump movement in the Democratic Party is extremely strong right now. Uh, the Democrats in Congress don't want to work with him either. Uh, I won't say either. Many Republicans do want to work with him on a number of issues, but the Democrats, for the most part, don't want to work with him. I think there's potential, by the way, for uh, Democrats to work with Trump on some issues, and I think he has made some real strategic mistakes in his first 100 days as president in his choice of uh, issues focus. Uh, where I saw that there was real potential for him to build bipartisan coalitions on some core issues such as infrastructure, where we could be having a very different conversation today uh, than we're having right now about his first 100 days. Uh, because primarily we're going to be talking about what hasn't happened and what promises have not been fulfilled. Uh, and I would argue it doesn't have to be that way. But right now you have a highly fractionalized Republican Party majority and a highly energized Democratic Party majority that doesn't want to help Mr. Trump. Uh, he's toxic right now, as far as they're concerned. And the resistance movement in the United States, if you've been following the news, it's just remarkable. I haven't seen this level of liberal progressive political engagement activism, uh, I'm old enough to say this, since the days of the U.S. war in Vietnam in the late 1960s and early 1970s when there were massive demonstrations throughout the country. But those are massive demonstrations about a war. We're having a different massive demonstration, it seems, every couple of weeks in Washington, D.C. and cities throughout the country. Um, the women's issue demonstration that they had uh, just barely a week after the presidential inauguration, which drew a much larger crowd than the inauguration did. Um, this past Saturday, over 200,000 people marching in Washington, D.C. on climate issues. I live right on the edge of the swamp, right? Mr. Trump calls it the swamp, and I live in uh, suburban Maryland just over the border. Uh, and I work in suburban Virginia just over the border on the other side, so I get to drive through the swamp every day. Um, so Mr. Trump says he wants to drain the swamp. You've heard that rhetoric, right? So, you know, actually Washington, D.C. was built in a swamp, truth be told. Um, they, they dredge the swamp, you know, and they, they put a city there, and it's really nice, I, you know, I love it. Um, but you think of a swamp, and it's kind of mucky, it's dirty, and you want to, you know, get that ugly stuff out of there and clean it up. Um, and that's, that's sort of the imagery that he's been relying upon. Um, but there was a remarkable thing, by the way, that happened on Saturday, right? So we had maybe a quarter million people, it was like, Somebody has to figure out how to do crowd estimating now in Washington, D.C., because we're having so many of them. The people argue about how big the crowds are. Um, it was a lot of people, let's say that. I know that's accurate. Um, but there were a lot of people in Washington, D.C., right, there to project their viewpoint on climate change issues. The president was 120 miles away in Pennsylvania giving a political rally for his own supporters. So... He wasn't around to listen to the protest or even think, he just, he got out of town, right? That evening, the White House press corps is having their annual dinner, at which presidents historically have always come there um, for one evening of just fun and games and telling stories and doing skits, where in this inevitably contentious relationship, Adult human beings can come together for one night with, you know, and, and, and get along with each other and kind of make fun of themselves and what they're doing. And there's, there's some real utility to that, right? You can, if you can sit in a room with the people who are judging your administration every day and you can, you can see them a different side, it humanizes them, right? It's not, the, it's not that evil press. And Mr. Trump, uh, the way that he's been going after the press, um, 
All presidents, by the way, complain about their press coverage. That's normal. They all say, you know, they're, they're hypercritical. If they would just get out of the way and stop criticizing so much, I can achieve so many more great things for America, right? Um, they're a big problem. And that's okay. Um, you know, every, every single president has always complained about, I got unfair press coverage. They, you know, they didn't really report all the great things I was doing. They're reporting all the little scandals and these, you know, these little distractions. Uh, but Mr. Trump takes it to another level. He's trying to delegitimize in the minds of the American people the very role that an independent press plays in our society. Your fake news, right? That's what he tells them. Um, and he is really a master at communicating directly with his supporters, going right over the heads of the mainstream media, and having a conversation directly um, with the people uh, who support him. And thus, he is able to um, project his message on his own terms uh, without having to rely upon uh, major media to do so. So, um, what happened on Saturday, I think, is just a nice illustration of what things look like in polarized American politics right now, right? You have the press people doing their thing all by themselves. You have Trump doing his thing with his supporters all by themselves. You have the protesters, you know, they're all together. All the like-minded people are in their own space doing their own thing and nobody's coming together to um, try to work on com common problems and issues that um, plague the country right now. So again, this is a difficult governing situation for the president because he does not have a united Republican party and there's a highly energized and mobilized opposition um, against him at the same time. Okay, so looking at the various uh, policy positions and promises of the president, um, so, how do you drain the swamp? He said, enact new ethics reforms uh, to reduce the corrupting influence, he called it, of special interests on our politics. All politicians talk about getting rid of the special interests, and I always wonder who those special interests are. Um, they're everybody who disagrees with me. Um, you know, so my position is for the greater good. Everything else is special interest. Uh, but many of his 100-day action plan promises dealt with different areas of, um, uh, of ethics. So banning White House and congressional officials from becoming lobbyists for a period of five years after serving in government, um, restricting White House officials from ever being employed as lobbyists for foreign governments after they leave public service, uh, stopping foreign lobbyists from raising money for American elections. And one of the first things he did as president was to uh, issue an executive memorandum imposing a freeze on all hiring in the executive branch of the federal government. Um, something which he's actually somewhat pulled back uh, because it became highly problematic for him. Uh, so this is one area where you know, the president has said that he would put forth a number of significant reforms in his first 100 days and really very little there has happened. Um, he said he would introduce ethics reform measures called the Clean Up Corruption in Washington Act and also uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, term limits for all members of Congress. So if you don't know this, one of the populist uh, issues in American politics over the past generation has been there should be limits on the number of terms that members of Congress should be allowed to serve. Okay. Um, public opinion surveys in the United States consistently show that there is very strong, overwhelming majority support for imposing term limits on members of Congress. The problem is who gets to vote on term limits? Members of Congress. So uh, they have not shown any interest in voting to basically fire themselves um, out of their positions. And it's not going to happen. But here you have, right, this is what happens in American politics. The president runs on a number of issue uh, platform positions, right? He wins an election. He says, I have a mandate to govern now. And then he puts this issue uh, before his own majority political party in both houses of Congress, and what's the reaction he gets? Dead on arrival. This is going nowhere. The majority leader of the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell, um, said, I would say we have term limits now. They're called an election. So think about it, right? You can limit the terms of members of Congress very easily. You vote for the other guy. Um, you know, so, and then he said, it will not be on the, the agenda of the Senate. 
So, so there you go. Um, again, we're not like a parliamentary system. Uh, the Congress can do what it wants, and uh, even members of the President's own party can say, sorry, Mr. President, this one's off the agenda. We're not even going to touch this issue. Immigration and domestic security. Um, well, again, the President proposed that he would suspend immigration from what he called uh, terror problem regions, and he would deport all criminal aliens from the United States. Uh, he said on the first day of his presidency, he would take executive actions to cancel all federal funding for sanctuary cities. Uh, so you may have seen in the news, this is an issue that's gotten a lot of play in the United States. We have a, a federalism dispute going on right now. The um, president says he wants to search out and remove from the country uh, criminal illegal aliens. Um, and this is being defined very broadly, by the way. And some, uh, excuse me, some cities have said, we are sanctuaries. We will protect people um, who are within our jurisdiction. We will not cooperate with the federal authorities to help search out and remove, um, you know, quote unquote, illegal immigrants. And so the president said, fine, then I'm going to cancel all federal money. Uh, that goes to these uh, jurisdictions. And San Francisco, Seattle, some others said, okay, cancel federal funds, we're not changing our position. Took the administration to court. Right now, um, the president's action has been stopped in the courts, and that's being litigated. Uh, he said he would begin removing uh, criminal illegal immigrants from the country and canceling visas to foreign countries that won't take them back and he would suspend immigration again from terror-prone regions where he said uh, vetting cannot properly occur. Five days into his presidency, he signed executive orders to uh, signal his intention to build a long border wall between the United States and Mexico, and to order the immediate detainment and deportation of illegal immigrants, and the hiring of 5,000 additional border patrol agents. Um, again, little has been done to implement this, and in fact, in the president's budget, um, money for building the wall is not there. That's been taken out. So, also, the president has been given a lot of lessons in his first 100 days about the realities of the system of separated powers in the United States. So, he expressed astonishment, surprise, first of all, that on day one of his presidency, the Republican majorities in Congress did not have the policy proposals all there ready for him. That they didn't get it all ready, you know, in time for him on day one. So he's now blaming the Congress, okay, his own political party, uh, for not having taken the initiative on the issues that he campaigned on and not having bills already ready for him. In the legislative process in the United States, if you want to get something done, you put forth a bill and you watch it go down and you, and you stay engaged in the process over a multiple period of years before finally someday you can put together you know, a majority coalition and get this thing done through both houses of Congress and have a president who's actually willing to sign it. It's not that easy, Mr. Trump. Um, you know, they're not going to just be all ready with everything ready to go, you know, boom, on day one. Um, the courts, right? Courts have stepped in and stop the so-called Muslim ban, or you know, the ban uh, from immigration of uh, citizens from uh, what the president called six uh, terror-prone countries and Syria indefinitely. And so uh, the president has expressed exasperation that, um, you know, I've got this federal judge out there in this little island called Hawaii, um, you know, who's, uh, who's, who's blocking the president of the United States. How does that work? and Congress didn't have those bills ready. And in, in one of the more remarkable statements um, recently, he started to blame the Constitution uh, for his problems. So now, to be fair to him, um, I'll, you know, let me, let, let, me play, let me play the other side here a little bit and be fair, right? So the President says, um, the United States Constitution puts too many constraints on the ability of the President to you know, get things done. That's our system, right? My poli-sci one-on-one students, they all know that. Um, that you know, so, you know, 
bad James Madison, it's all his fault, right? The author of our Constitution. Um, but again, you know, Woodrow Wilson, the political scientist, before he was president of the United States, wrote an entire book making the argument that the constitutional founders' notion of separation of powers that put constraints on the ability of presidents to move forward their policy objectives you know, was an antiquated idea, and it should be changed. And he expressed support for something closer to a parliamentary-style democracy where you have mandate-oriented elections, you have a majority party that's governing that uh, controls the legislative branch and the executive branches simultaneously, and things get done. Um, so Mr. Trump is not the first president to um, express the opinion that the, the constitutional order of the United States makes it really difficult for presidents to get things done. And other presidents have lamented um, the various restrictions on the powers of the presidency that exist under our constitutional system, which of course are real. Um, you know, the founders of our republic came out of a monarchy and they didn't want strong central power, and they didn't want strong executive power, and they put all kinds of limits um, on the ability of presidents to get things done, and presidents have struggled with it ever since, and many of, you, many of us think we're all, the, we're all the better for it. So, when a fed, when federal court strikes down um, the ban on immigration from the terror-prone countries, the president has a choice. He can fight this all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, he believes that the, uh, the judicial decision on his um, immigration ban was constitutionally wrongly decided, uh, or he can simply issue a new executive order that gets around the constitutional problems identified um, in the federal court. So he tried that, and that one uh, got struck down too um, in federal court. So this, so this matter is going to stay before the courts for a while. So anyway, um, again, the president has found that things are a lot more difficult. The president can't just come in and say, uh, you know, uh, do this, do that, and things just start happening. It's nothing like the private sector. It's nothing like running a big business. Uh, the one place where the president indeed has had um, uh, a significant victory would be the um, nomination of Neil Gorsuch, the um, federal judge, to the Supreme Court of the United States. So, so you see that Mr. Trump has um, had successful approval of a large number of his cabinet positions. He has received a lot of criticism, though, for not filling second-level positions in his administration. So there are many important policy positions that remain unoccupied, uh, and many say that that's one of the problems he is having in getting control of the executive bureaucracy. Uh, you'll have a lot of holdovers from the uh, Obama administration, for example, who are in positions of power in a Trump administration, and they can do a lot. Um, and he's been extremely slow to fill a lot of these positions. Um, but he did act quickly, as he said that he would do uh, during the campaign, to fill that open seat on the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, Neil Gorsuch's confirmation was bogged down in the Senate because of intense opposition by Democrats. Traditionally, there has been um, a, a practice in the Senate, a customary practice, that there be a super majority, at least 60 out of 100, to confirm a federal judge nominated by the president, okay, including judges to the Supreme Court of the United States. It is nowhere written in the Constitution. Um, you know, that has just been a norm or conventional practice that has been in place for many, many years. And Mr. Trump directed the Senate uh, Majority Leader if he would agree to do so, uh, to exercise what they referred to as the nuclear option, which is, you know, blow up the rule and change it, uh, institute a rules change so that you only need a simple majority in order to confirm one nominated to the Supreme Court of the United States. And that's what they had to do in order to get Neil Gorsuch on the court. By the way, um, Maybe it was a bad thing that they did this. Certainly, uh, the Republicans have received a lot of criticism for it, but politically it worked out brilliantly for them. So, Antonin Scalia passes away. President Barack Obama has the opportunity to nominate a jurist to the Supreme Court. Republicans said, nope, they're the majority in the Senate. We're not gonna have hearings, sorry. And 
Democrats said, you can't do that. You're supposed to have hearings. And there's nothing they could do to make the senators um, hold hearings and have a confirmation vote. So they just blocked it and waited out the election. Well, what's the choice that the Democrats have? Make it a campaign issue. But there's a problem there. Who feels the most intensely about the court? The evangelical core of the Republican Party. You know, the people referred to generally as the religious right. Okay? So, one of the mysteries of this campaign people have talked about, without saying so much about the personal character of Mr. Trump, you know all the stories, right? That he was the favorite candidate of the evangelical conservatives, the religious right movement, and got 81% of their votes in this election cycle, bettering at the polls what Mitt Romney, John McCain, George Bush, okay, were able to achieve with that constituency. Now, there's very little in his personal background or personal conduct, right, that you would think dovetails exactly with, you know, what the religious conservatives claim that they're all about. And people said, look at that, hypocrisy. This is awful. So, um, why support Mr. Trump? Supreme Court? It's a really good reason, actually. If there's one area where Mr. Trump can have a deeply profound impact on the future of American public life, if in all other areas his presidency is a big fail, okay, but he gets to appoint at least a couple judges to the Supreme Court of the United States and maybe more during his four years in office if it's only four years, okay? Um, he can shift the direction of constitutional law in the United States for decades. It looks possible that the so-called swing vote, Anthony Kennedy, who's over 80 years old, may step down. Okay? That is going to dramatically swing the momentum of the court in a very conservative direction. So, I've written books on the religious right movement in American politics. I've, I've studied it for a very long time. And I've been working on a piece about uh, Trump and the religious right. And I've interviewed a lot of the uh, uh, leading figures in the movement. And they will say, very candidly, we know about this guy, okay? This is not a mystery to us, okay? Three times married, the whole bit, you know, worshiper of global capital and, you know, um, goes before Liberty University and mangles the Bible, you know, trying to sound like them and he can't even say it right. Um, you know, which became, a, which became a matter of laughter to some people. None of it mattered, right? What is more important, the personal character of one man or the policy implications for millions of people due to the policies of the next administration when it's Hillary Clinton as your choice, right? Um, and the implications of the appointments to the Supreme Court of the United States. So, from their standpoint, um, this was a major issue of consideration um, in the presidential campaign. And Mr. Trump, brilliantly in the campaign, okay, put this issue right front and center in American politics and said, here's my list of conservative pro-life jurists. And I will pick from that list Okay, um, to the Supreme Court when I have a chance to. So there you have it. It was all out there. Okay, and the religious conservatives. I mean, for years they have complained when they have backed mainstream Republican candidates for the presidency and other political offices. Um, they have not achieved very much um, policy as a result of their loyal support for these Republicans. The mainstream Republicans who get elected, they'll focus on foreign policy, the economy, but it's always put the social issues on the back burner. We have to wait. These issues are too contentious. The time is not right. Um, so they lost their patience with um, you know, even mainstream conservatives. Why did Mr. Trump look so good to, to them? Because he does not owe a thing to the establishment. He's not one of them. In fact, the Republican establishment did everything they could in the presidential election to try to stop him. 
okay? And so he needs them. And there's one thing about Mr. Trump's personality, for good or bad, okay, um, that people who know him well say is absolutely true. The loyalty factor runs very deep in that man's veins, okay? Um, the people he's close to in his family, his business associates, okay, people he'd worked with for years, um, the people who supported him in this campaign. He's not going to listen to those protesters. He says, I'm going out to Pennsylvania, state that picked me, and I'm going to talk to my people, okay? Um, it's not a good prescription for governing, quite frankly, uh, because you have, you have to build coalitions, you have to work across the political aisle, you have to, um, you, know, you have to confront your opposition to get things done sometimes. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's where that stands. So uh, to this point, Mr. Trump has also had some significant disagreements with regard to uh, his appointments. His labor, uh, Secretary of Labor nominee had to withdraw. Uh, his National Security Advisor, Michael Flynn, the story you know, uh, was fired less than a month into the Trump administration uh, for having lied about conversations that he said he didn't have with the uh, Russian ambassador. And now there's all these allegations about um, you know, the Russian tampering with the American elections last year and whether high-level people in the Trump campaign knew about it and participated in it. Um, and if that actually finds evidence, if, if there's evidence that goes all the way to the top, you're talking really big-time serious scandal here, impeachable offense. Uh, but none of that's been proven to this point. Okay, um, so maybe everything I'm going to say today is going to be undone by the House of vote. I don't know. The House of Representatives is having a vote yet again uh, to try to repeal and replace Obamacare. But you know, so here was the president's main policy promise or priority, saying that again, it's going to be so easy. This is what he said in the campaign. It's going to be so easy to repeal and replace Obamacare. You're going to keep your benefits. Okay, you're going to be able to keep your insurance, your premiums are going to go down, and the quality of your health care is going to go up. So, I mean, that sounds really appealing, right? I mean, um, you know, it's, it's going to cost less, and it's going to be higher quality, and nobody's going to be booted out of the system. Um, you know, I'd love to live in that world where it's that easy. Uh, but anyway, that, you know, that, that's what he was promising, and his first act as president on January 20th was to sign an executive order establishing procedures for the eventual repeal and replacement of Obamacare. But a funny thing happened along the way. The Republican Party doomed it. You had the right-wing Republicans who were saying, repeal and reduce costs, however you do it, okay? The moderate Republicans saying, replace it, but we don't want to kick our constituents off of the um, benefits roles that they're that they're on right now. So you have this division now within the Republican Party over what is the right policy approach, completely predictable. Um, they should have known that was going to happen. And eventually, um, the Republicans pulled their plan after the Congressional Budget Office did an analysis of the Republican plan and concluded it would be enormously costly and it would drive up the number of uninsured Americans from 10 to 20 percent of the United States population. Uh, and so it also violated a core promise of the president, which was that nobody would lose their insurance under his plan. Well, that just turned out to be flat out wrong. And so the Republicans pulled their own bill, and the Speaker of the House, the Republican leader of the House of Representatives, Paul Ryan, said, we are going to be living with Obamacare for the foreseeable future. Um, interestingly, in public opinion polls, the Obamacare program is more popular now than it's ever been. Isn't that interesting? Everything that they have done has driven up support for the opposite point of view. Um, so they couldn't even get that right. Well, think about it this way, right? In the campaign context, on a superficial level, people are hearing, you get to keep your insurance, it's going to cost less, and the quality of your health care is going to be better. It all sounds really good. But at some point, Republicans had to put forth a real bill with real details that could be analyzed, right? And then people started, look, here's what Americans care about more than anything about public policy proposals. How is this going to affect me? That's, na you know, that's natural, right? How is this going to affect me? Well, people started to look at, okay, there's a real bill. Obamacare might be repealed. 
What's my health care going to look like? Really? That's going to happen? And all of a sudden, support for the Republican repeal and replace uh, starts to dry up, and Obamacare becomes highly popular, which it never was when Obamacare was you know, passed with only Democratic Party votes, which, by the way, I think was a huge mistake um, by the former president. Um, you know, getting through a bill that was vulnerable to being repealed and replaced over time because it didn't have support uh, from anybody from the opposition party. Okay. Tax reform and other domestic priorities in the budget. Uh, the president promised that he would simplify the tax code, reduce the number of tax brackets from seven down to three, cut corporate tax rates from 35% to 15% and eliminate the estate tax, which, by the way, affects 0.002% of the population in any given year. But it costs a lot of money to um, lose that revenue, nonetheless. Like with Obamacare, the president is finding out that achieving his legislative consensus with the Republican majority is actually very, very complicated to do. Um, already in Congress, Republicans are divided over particular details of the president's proposal uh, one that some analysts have pointed out time and again would substantially enrich the president and his own family uh, if it were to become law. I'm not suggesting that's the motivation behind it, but um, this is the problem too. We've never had a president before who's been the leader of a large international company. Um, and so when the president says something nice about a really nasty foreign leader, you know, and says he wants to get together with them, and you see that the, the Trump company has financial interest uh, in that other place, you know, people start raising these questions about potential conflicts of interest and the like. Uh, so the problem here is, of course, how do you pay for all of this, right? The president has promised to do so many different things, um, and yet you know, his various policy priorities would be very, very expensive if enacted. Now, he's saying tax cuts raise revenue. I'm not an economist, I don't pretend to know whether that's true or not, but intuitively it doesn't make sense to me um, that if you cut tax rates you get more revenue, but you know, that's, that, is a, that is a core belief of many conservatives, right, that you lower tax rates, you spur more economic development, and, and in the long run um, that generates more revenue for the federal government. It's a big, big risk, especially when you consider the size of the federal debt in the United States right now. Um, the president also has said that he will put forth a number of actions uh, for infrastructure and clearing the way for the Keystone XL pipeline and other American oil pipelines. Um, and let's go to, okay, I don't, I don't read off the PowerPoint, so this is just supplemental information. How about the president's budget, the budgetary priorities of this administration? Well, that's kind of hard to read that in all details, but um, let me just say it this way. It puts a lot more money into defense, and it takes a lot of money out of other things. Um, you know, that's the, that's the simplification of all, the, of all those numbers there. So, you know, the folks from the United States State Department were very nice to, you know, uh, collaborate in this whole effort to have me as a speaker here tonight and in several other cities here in Germany for a week. And they're telling me they're very concerned about what's going to happen to these cultural exchange and international visitor type programs because the president's talking about massive cuts. Uh, to the budgets in uh, diplomacy and foreign policy, you know, in diplomatic uh, areas of the State Department and reducing the workforce of the State Department by as much as 9-10%. So we, we're seeing a huge increase being proposed for the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security, and then eliminating funding for a National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, big cutbacks in Environmental Protection Agency, um, National Institute for Health, um, uh, food and Drug Administration and the like, you know, all the people who do the regulatory things that are supposed to help keep Americans safe, right? Um, and the President is saying that one of his priorities is to reduce the regulatory burden on various industries, which means that the government's going to do a lot less to oversee, um, you know, food safety and testing of, uh, you know, proposed medicines and environmental protection and all those things. So that's why we're having all these massive demonstrations. There are a lot of people who feel very threatened by all of this, and they're deeply concerned about the long-term consequences um, on our country and internationally of the president's policy priorities. Okay, quickly, so I leave time for questions and answers. Uh, the president's foreign policy agenda. So the president's um, 
rhetoric and the White House website in particular states, the Trump administration is committed to a foreign policy focused on American interests and American national security. So you hear this theme over and over again, America first, uh, coming out of um, uh, the president and his administration. Embedded through the White House webpage on foreign policy is such things as cutting the trade deficit, renegotiating what the president calls bad trade deals, um, punishing foreign trade abuses, labeling China a currency manipulator, reducing dependence on foreign oil, protecting American jobs. So it's all extremely inward looking, right? Um, all of these things that comprise the focus of a foreign policy agenda. Um, and this is you know, quite a major change in emphasis uh, for a presidential administration. Uh, there is no mention of the words foreign policy, actually, in the president's Gettysburg Address in his 100 Days Action Plan. But a lot of attention there was paid to foreign trade, relationships with foreign trading partners, impact of unfair trade practices on American jobs. And the president, of course, is focused on things such as withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was dead in Congress anyway, uh, by the way, or renegotiating NAFTA or withdrawing completely from the deal, which he has completely changed his position on that, by the way. He's now saying we might just tweak it a little bit, you know, do a little revision here or there. He's not talking about getting rid of it. Directing his Secretary of the Treasury to label China a currency manipulator, well, that one's not happening either. Um, so the president has discovered, and I think maybe this is the good part of the story tonight, um, that there is utility to having a good relationship, a good working relationship with China, right? The other major world power right now. With all that's going on in the Korean Peninsula, uh, the president, I think, has discovered the great importance of working with uh, President Xi Jinping and working with the Chinese government um, and trying to get the Chinese to take a lead position in dealing with the North Korea problem. Um, so the president's not going to label China now a currency manipulator. And you just see time and time again, there's been a kind of pulling back from some of these campaign positions that the president took, right, over, you know, over NAFTA and over labeling China a currency manipulator, um, you know, backing away from the border wall. I mean, some of these were the most memorable consistent, persistently made promises on the campaign trail. So, American political analysts, right, looking at this election, so they all got it wrong during the election. Nobody believed this guy Trump was going to win. Probably he didn't either, um, truth be told. But they're trying to explain. Well, Hillary Clinton was trying to explain it herself two days ago. So if you saw the news, she was blaming the director of the FBI, James Comey, for the letter you know, that he issued reopening the investigation into the email scandal. And the polling data showed that the trajectory um, uh, that demonstrated a positive movement consistently in the Clinton direction going into the election was stopped dead right there. Um, now, you can blame Cast all you want, but, and she did, and to be fair to her, she did say this in her interview. You know, she said, I take responsibility. I'm the person on the ballot. I've lost the election. And, uh, you know, I have to bear the burden of that. So, uh, but, you know, during the campaign, right, I thought about this. So. Now, let me ask you, what were, you know, what were the things that stood out about Donald Trump's promises? If you had to just reduce it to a simple slogan, okay, a couple things. Anybody? Yes? Donald Trump's, <clears throat> Donald Trump's promises mostly, uh, to fear, uh, oftentimes very much existential fear. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no coincidence that he was able to, to uh, well, be somewhat successful with the Rust Belt mm -hmm. um, because he appeared, appealed to their very much justified fear that, that their existence is very much threatened, at least as they know it. Okay, 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 good. So, what would be some of the slogans in the campaign that would fit? Um, what you just suggested, that you know, this was appealing to some people's fears. Build a wall, right? End illegal immigration. I mean, you, you, know, you, can, you can come up with four or five really concrete things very easily in talking about his campaign. Um, in US audiences, when I've asked people, you know, it's like they almost sing it in unison, right? Build the wall, stop illegal immigration, make America great again. You know, it's, just, you know, it's, it's like four or five things that just stick in people's heads over and over again. 
Um, and then I say, let's do the same thing for Hillary Clinton, and everybody's kind of looking around, you know, uncomfortable, saying, um, well, what, what was it? So, um, ready to be president? You know, I thought, okay, well, doesn't everybody supposed to be, aren't they all supposed to be ready to be president? Uh, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not putting her down. I mean, she, uh, you know, she had, I think, a much more nuanced understanding of a lot of complex issues, and, you know, as an academic person, I certainly admire that. Um, but in a campaign context, right, you have to have a message and you have to repeat it and, um, you know, and, and you have to appeal to people uh, on an emotional level, which you're, you know, which you're accurately saying uh, Donald Trump was able to do, you know, whether it was hitting in fear or, you know, some other emotions uh, that were deeply embedded in people. You know, the United States is a really good place to live. I, you know, lived there all my life. I think it's a good place. But when someone's saying, make America great again, that tells, and, and people respond to that, uh, that tells me there, there's a lot of frustration out there, and there is. Um, there's a lot of frustration with traditional politics and traditional politicians and um, with the inability of um, our leaders to solve certain policy problems. That is, that is out there, okay? Forget about the fact that the economy is pretty good and 95% of the people have jobs. Um, you know, there's a lot of really frustrated people, and there are people in certain sectors of the economy who are suffering. And Mr. Trump was able to reach those people uh, in the campaign. Uh, so again, the problem is the realities of governing, right? So one of the themes here, of course, is uh, one, the president has run into the constraints that all presidents have to deal with embedded in a system of separated powers where the courts and Congress can stop the president at every turn from trying to affect his agenda. And second, no matter what presidents promise in a campaign context, they cannot drive the agenda from day one. That's just a plain fact. Agendas are given to presidents. Agendas are set by the president's predecessor. Like it or not, everything Mr. Obama did for the previous eight years, and everything Mr. Bush did in foreign policy, the, you know, the eight years before that, and put it all together, um, you know, you are not dealt a clean hand, right? when you start your presidency, a clean slate, and you get to make the policy agenda according to your own vision for what the good society looks like. That doesn't exist. Which is why Mr. Trump perhaps is right when he says the 100-day standard is a phony standard, because no two presidents come into office having been dealt the same hand, or even a hand that's remotely similar to anyone else. Circumstances differ uh, significantly from one administration to the next. The important thing is, whether the president is adaptable, flexible, able to move uh, according to the various crises that emerged that he did not anticipate, okay? He's being put to the test by certain foreign leaders with um, some very bad intentions, um, uh, but that's, you know, that's been done to other presidents. How does he respond to that? Does he just stick to the, to the same campaign sloganeering, right? Um, or does he, adapt himself to the realities, and you're seeing a lot of that with Mr. Trump, for which you know, I think he does deserve some credit, and he's adopted a more traditional National Security Council right now. He got Stephen Bannon off of there, um, you know, and a lot of his administration is starting to look a lot more, uh, in some respects, like a traditional Republican administration. So, um, you know, that holds out the hope that, you know, there is a learning curve an understanding on the part of the president um, about the nature of the political system, how it works, and you know that perhaps he is getting some some good advice um, about what he needs to be doing as president. So, anyway, um, that was a strange one, by the way, wasn't it? I, I, I just you know, um, I, what was more strange, that or Ivanka Trump sitting next to her? So, that that, that I don't know. Oh, on, on that issue, by the way, I'll just say very quickly, um, the nepotism thing is very bothersome, for sure. Uh, I think nepotism is always wrong, whether it's in business, government. Um, on the other hand, I was, I was just thinking about this the other day. Um, there was a wonderful book written many years ago by a fellow named George Reedy. He was a press secretary to uh, Lyndon Johnson. And the book's called The Twilight of the Presidency. And at one point in the book, he asks, what is, what is the major problem with the American presidency? Um, it's that presidents surround themselves with sycophants. 
people who tell the president what he wants to hear, not what he needs to hear, people who flatter him every single day, people who have their own personal ambition, and that comes first, and everything that they do is geared toward how they can promote themselves. They're not thinking about what's in the best interest of the president every day. They're not telling him what he needs to hear. The president doesn't have people around him who are saying, that's the stupidest idea. I think I've heard you ever put forward. You can't possibly be thinking of doing that. No, it's you know wonderful. You're great, Mr. President. Um, who's going to tell you what you need to hear? Who's going to be really candid? Who can do that in your life for you? Your family. So, um, I'm less troubled than many people are by the fact that Ivanka Trump, you know, has a portfolio, an official portfolio in the White House. I think on some issues her instincts are much better than this, perhaps. So, um, you know, be that as it may, I'll, you know, I, won't, I won't say anything more. Uh, but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe. Um, you know, maybe some, maybe that's controlling some of his impulses that people were very concerned about, right? So in one of my speeches a couple of days ago, someone got up and said, I'm really afraid that there's going to be wars and, you know, all these terrible things are going to happen all because of Donald Trump. And um, I'm not that pessimistic, actually, um, about it. And I think maybe uh, the fact that the president has surrounded himself with some more traditional type leaders and he's got some trusted members of his family closer to him, um, you know, that he's going to listen a little bit more and, and take advice. So, one other thing, um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this part because we're, we're running out of, out of time. The ongoing issues, I've made that point, uh, the presidents have to deal with those. Um, so the 100-day strategy has gotten off to a rocky start, of course, for this president. Uh, he's getting a lot of criticism because he has not achieved any major um, legislative outcomes. He's relied on executive actions, particularly executive orders, to get some things done. Uh, there's been little trade, or excuse me, little progress on a number of key issues uh, that he had focused on in his presidential campaign. Uh, one example, by the way, of why leadership by executive order uh, is no substitute for legislating. So uh, on the third day of his presidency, the president issued an executive order that reinstituted um, a policy that's been derisively called the gag rule. What is the gag rule? Um, it is a mandate that no U.S. federal funds may go to international family planning or aid organizations that either promote abortion, practice abortion, or even discuss abortion as an option. Okay? Now, President Ronald Reagan instituted such an executive memorandum in 1985 under existing legislative authority that he claimed that he had to do so. You know, that became known as the gag rule. Gag is, you can't talk. If you talk, you lose the federal funds. If you mention that word, if you advise people that that's an option, you get cut off from U.S. federal funds, okay? Um, his successor, George H.W. Bush, on his first day in office, issued an executive order affirming and strengthening that policy. On his first day in office in 1993, Bill Clinton issued an executive order overturning all of it. On his first day, and you see where this is going, on his first day in office in 2001, George W. Bush issued an executive order reinstituting the policy. Imagine how this is looking to international aid organizations, right, that, you know, rip up those brochures now, you can't, you, you, know, you can't have that in there. Um, on his first day in office in 2009, Barack Obama, again, um, overturned the policy, and Donald Trump, thank him, he waited three days. Um, he issued an executive order, reinstituting. So, um, so that, you know, you can only go so far with uh, executive orders, um, and the real test of the Trump presidency <coughs> over time will be his ability to affect real policy change um, by building legislative consensus. So, Bottom line here, last thing I want to say before I take your questions, I think where he has gone wrong is his choice uh, on the policy agenda. Um, presidents, I think, are better advised to focus coming out of the beginning of their administration on issues where they can build a consensus, deliver some legislative victories, develop a reputation for 
effective leadership right off the beginning and then build on those victories in order to do more complicated things later on. Where the president got into trouble is, rather than finding an area of bipartisan support, such as infrastructure, where the Democrats have said they want to work with him on that, and where there is a consensus that that really needs to be done, and that would be a major accomplishment of his presidency if he could get that done. He put forth Obamacare first instead, a highly polarizing issue for which there's not even a consensus within his own political party. Or he, if he had decided on a one-party strategy rather than a bipartisan consensus on an issue where that's possible and focused on tax reform, okay? I think if he had come up with a modest proposal on tax reform, he easily could have gotten Republican majorities and we'd be having a different conversation today about his first 100 days and what he's been able to accomplish. But yet again, he's coming back to Obamacare, right? And they're going to have a vote in the House of Representatives today, and probably the Senate is going to say no if the House passes it. Um, and as we were talking before, it's probably ultimately all for show at this point, so that the members of Congress can say, we tried, sorry, the Senate mixed it, the President can say, I tried, um, take political credit, but nothing gets done. So anyway, I will stop there and take your questions. Yeah.